who are the powers in the region who would support the Muslim Brotherhood and are actually supporting the Muslim Brotherhood. So the Qataris invested billions. Muslim Brotherhood came to power in Tunisia. Muslim Brotherhood came to power in Egypt. And Libya has become divided between the Muslim Brotherhood and other Al-Qaeda types nowadays. Americans tasked Qatar to remove Assad from power. Right. put his signature on a secret CIA uh, operation uh, called Timber Sycamore. And Timber Sycamore is the, one of the costliest CIA operations in, in the history of the agency. You grew up as a Christian in Syria. What is the state of Christianity over there? Christian community has lost probably 60%, even more. And this was targeted. Yeah. And I can, I can give you an example. Example, why it was in this episode of the reality based podcast we are going to be talking to Kavork Almasian now Kavork is the host of a YouTube channel called Syriana analysis this is a channel that I watch pretty regularly because his knowledge and commentary takes me seriously out of my comfort zone and it's the kind of perspective that you don't really gain if you live in a Western country and you watch Western media unless you really seek it out now Kavork is a third generation descendant of survivors of the Armenian genocide he was born and raised in Aleppo, which is in the northern part of Syria. He studied international relations and diplomacy. He also studied European affairs in Paris, as well as political science with a focus on Middle Eastern politics in Lebanon. So it's safe to say Kavork is an expert in Middle Eastern politics, which is in my humble opinion, one of the most difficult fields that you could possibly go into. And this one does get a bit complicated at times. And there are certain events and timelines that I do try and seek a little bit of clarification on so that we don't get too lost in the weeds. But if these topics are something that you're interested in and want to learn more about, then I would definitely recommend checking out Kavork's channel. So some of the topics that we covered include what it was like growing up in Syria and what it was like being in that region of the world during the time of the Arab Spring uprising. How Syria and other parts of the Middle East became destabilized over the past few decades. Many different factors and moving parts, including US and Israeli involvement amongst other players, as well as something that hits a little bit closer to home, namely the devastating destruction of Christianity in the Middle East, which is obviously the birthplace of the religion. So we try not to take any easy interviews here. This one is designed to take a step back from the Western culture war and give a reality-based perspective from a completely different lens. So I really hope you enjoy this as much as I did. I hope you learn a few things along the way as I did. And with that, I give to you Kevork Almasian. Kevork Almasian, thank you so much for joining me on the Reality Based Podcast. Thank you so much for having me. It's a really pleasure to be with you. Now, you are from Syria. And the reason why I wanted to get you on today was because I'm fascinated by the perspective of somebody who grew up in that region of the world in such a tumultuous time. And I often watch your channel. I think your commentary is absolutely brilliant. I learn a lot from it. So what was it like for you growing up in Syria before the Arab Spring? Actually, that's a very interesting question. And first of all, I'm humbled by your words. And uh, it really fuel, I feel like it's a fuel when people watch and appreciate the work that I do, because compared to the mainstream journalists, uh, we are not doing this for money. We are doing this for educational purposes and to enlighten the people mm. about uh, different geopolitical conflicts around the world. First of all, I was born in an Armenian family in Aleppo, in northern Syria, which means that my grandparents survived the Armenian genocide in 1915. And uh, we, like the Jewish people, we have a, a post-generational trauma, so a post-generational trauma. And our parents always told us about the uh, heinous crimes committed back then, 100 years ago, against the Armenian population. So we grew up more in a political family. Uh, we always speak about politics. We always speak about history and what happened in the past. And also in school, they teach us the history and Syria, more or less, because it's in, in, in West Asia, of course, it's an intersection. And many of the conflicts in recent times happened in this area. And I remember, mm. for example, the 9-11 attacks. And 9-11 attacks, so I was a kid, but still remember it like it's a, it's a, it's a memory, right? But um, the, 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 the major events that impacted me, for example, was the Second Intifada, uh, that I learned a lot uh, from the back then the television channels and back then the, the the TV channels were just showing what's happening there not like the current times the propaganda was not like uh, as severe as it is today so we had the intifada we had the invasion of Iraq and I remember the first time I went to a demonstration to protest against some so just quickly 
Do you mind giving a little bit of background as to what the second intifada was? Yes. So the Palestinian uprising against the occupation forces uh, mostly happened in West Bank and also uh, some of it was in the Gaza Strip and it was an unarmed uh, uh, uprising against the occupation forces, throwing the stones, the kids, these very famous uh, uh, scenes and photos of uh, throwing stones on the tanks and the occupation forces, and many of which. And during this time, uh, there was a policy adopted by the Israeli forces called breaking the bone. And this was an official mm. state policy that they were breaking the bones of the protesters and with with, with rocks and stones. And there are footage of it. Um, you can find it everywhere nowadays, uh, how the Israeli army were breaking the bones of children, for example, and how they were sending uh, fight dogs against the protesters to bite them. And uh, th those were scenes that you watch it when you are a kid. And then you see that the Americans go into war in, in Iraq, and this is next door. And in Syria, there, it was a big issue, uh, despite the fact that Syria and Iraq, they didn't have a like, good relationship. But we all opposed the uh, invasion of Iraq. And for myself, although I was a very young, but watching uh, the scenes, and back then, Al Jazeera also played a huge role in forming my political conscious. And I understood through these reportages and the uh, that happened after the invasion that Syria is going to be next. And we don't know mm. when, but it was only a matter of time that Syria would be targeted. And we understood that after the invasion of Iraq, the former Secretary of State of the United States, uh, he came calling Powell to Syria, and he presented the demands of the United States to Damascus in order for Syria to... Um, not to face similar... So what what year was this in? This was in 2003. So Colin... So in 2003. So, so, Colin, so Colin Powell what came. made you think that... Uh, what made you think that Syria was going to be next? Because does this have anything to do with, for example, the clean break memo that happened in the 1990s where they sort of explicitly laid out what the plan was? Actually, we also learned from, for example, Wesley Clark, who said uh, that uh, seven countries in five years. Uh, we learned about this later, but in Syria, locally, the local media was always telling the people that after Iraq, the Americans are going uh, to invade Syria, whether directly or indirectly. So the people were very cautious about uh, this case. And this is one of the reasons why Syria supported the resistance in Iraq. And the Americans have never forgotten that because... Uh, Hundreds of American soldiers got killed in Iraq due to the support of the Syrian side to the resistance there because the Syrian side realized that if they let the Americans um, have an easy time in Iraq, then they will come and destabilize Syria. And because Colin Powell came and told, uh, he presented list of demands to Damascus. First, that Syria has to distance itself from Iran. Second, Syria has to close the offices of the Palestinian uh, parties in Syria, namely Hamas, Jihad, the PLO, Jabhat Shabiye, and the rest. And the third was Syria has to cut its military aid to Hezbollah. I mean, most of the weapons that go to Hezbollah coming from Syria. Syria receives some of the weapons from Russia. The rest goes to Hezbollah. Similarly, Iranian weapons comes to Syria and some of them go to Hezbollah. So those were the demands of the American side, that if you don't uh, abide and obey these demands, then we are going to punish you. And when the Syrians said no, George Bush came and said that Syria is now part of the axis of evil and uh, impose sanctions on Syria, right? And see, between 2003 and 2005, there were a series of sanctions against Syria. The peak of it was in 2005. In 2005, actually what happened is, this is very interesting, the assassination of the former prime minister of Lebanon, Rafiq al-Hariri. And Rafiq al-Hariri was um, the point when the assassination happened, uh, like not even an hour after the assassination, they already accused Syria of killing him because Syria had uh, uh, forces in Lebanon and the Syrian forces went to Lebanon to stop the civil war with the jurisdiction of the Arab League and also with the tacit consent of the Americans. This was in a uh, few, few decades ago. But the Americans realized that the Syrians brought their air, air defenses to Lebanon. And when the Syrians have air defenses in Lebanon, Israel cannot bomb Syria from the skies of Lebanon anymore, right? And, mm. and what happened basically when the assassination happened, they 
uh, asked the UN Security Council and they uh, imposed uh, a resolution on Syria that Syria has to withdraw from Lebanon. And now Syria has to withdraw its air defenses as well from Lebanon, right? So Syria uh, became like naked, let's say, in front of, there is no more buffer zone between Syria and uh, Lebanon anymore. And here Syria thought that because they are withdrawing, they have to give the weapons that they have to Hezbollah. So they left most of the heavy weaponry that they had in Lebanon and sent it to Hezbollah because the intel told them that once Syria withdraws from Lebanon, Israel is going to invade Lebanon. And that's exactly what happened. Just one year later, the Israelis invaded in July 2006 Lebanon. And then the this was the first time that the Hezbollah side used its sophisticated weapons. Some of them were from the Syrian warehouses, for example, the Cornet rockets. And the Syrians were a uh, little bit, uh, they were not afraid, but they thought that the Russians are not going to be satisfied by that because they, this, those were meant to be for the Syrian army, but the Syrians gave them to Hezbollah. And Hezbollah is a non-state actor, and the Americans considered them a terrorist group. But the Russians were happy because the Cornet rockets have proven to be very efficient against the Israeli Mirkava tanks that the Israelis were very proud of, and they were trying to sell it to the rest of the world. And this was a big, uh, I would say, marketing hit for the Israeli side and for a good marketing uh, for, for, for the Russian side. So yeah, all these conflicts that happened in the region, and then the, you have the Gaza uh, massacres again, 2007, 2008, all these events just create a conscious, a political consciousness inside you. And also the conviction that the American side here, regardless of the administration, cannot be on the right side of history in West Asia because the American side, um, their, their economy is based on war. And when there is war, there is printing money. And when there is printing money, there is recycling money to the pockets of the people who are taking the decision to go to war. So we know that war for them is profitable, but for us, it's not profitable in Syria. And we know that every, every of the, each of these wars, wars were based either on manipulation or exaggeration or complete false allegations. And in the case of Iraq, it was clear. Right. And then uh, in the case of Lebanon, also the invasion of Lebanon, they said that because Hezbollah uh, captured an Israeli, uh, two Israeli soldiers on the borders, that this was a trigger to destroy uh, Lebanon. Uh, I mean, the response were not proportionate. Right. So when the Syrian conflict started in 2011, I, I at the beginning, of course, like anyone else in Syria, I was excited about what's happening in the Arab Spring. Back then, we used to call it an Arab string. I was excited because mm. we saw that uh, Ben Ali is gone and Mubarak, who was a very good ally with Israel, was gone. We thought that this is, an, this is going to lead into organic change in the region. And this is going to bring more, um, uh, let's say, democratic change in the region. And myself, as a student of international relations and diplomacy, um, I was double excited because this means more job opportunities for me as well. On a personal level, we would have, have now independent uh, think tanks, then uh, probably political parties right. that you could participate. But it only took me three months to understand that um, this was not about democracy in Syria. And definitely... If you don't mind giving a little bit of background as to what exactly happened during the Arab Spring, where the uprising started, how it trickled across all the way to Syria and all the way to that region of the world? Yeah, actually it started in Tunisia, uh, late 2010, early 2011, with uh, Bouazizi uh, burned himself in front of the government, one of the government buildings because he was, uh, uh, the official narrative is that he burned himself because uh, he was hungry and there were no job opportunities, etc. And this triggered protests against the government. What happened? Didn't the government steal his uh, steal his cart that he was working at, and he couldn't couldn't yeah, yeah. Uh, find a way to feed his family anymore, and then he burned himself alive? The thing is, with such uprisings, that the official narrative always that the people remove the president from power. But the truth of the matter is, mm. when the army turns against the uh, president, then the president has to flee the country or has to step down. This is what happened in Tunisia. The army told Ben Ali 
to step down and he chose to leave the country and he went to Saudi Arabia. The same thing happened in Egypt. It was the, it was the army which told Hosni Mubarak to step down. Yes, the people protest against the people, against the government, but they don't have the means to remove the president uh, from power, right? So the army in both of these countries told the presidents to go. So here comes the role of the Clinton administration uh, or Hillary Clinton's Mm. job. Hillary Clinton, Obama, they uh, managed this Arab Spring in a way that the outcome of these protests and these uprisings would be that the Muslim Brotherhood comes to power. So who who is who are the uh, powers in the region who would uh, support the Muslim Brotherhood and are actually supporting the Muslim Brotherhood? Qatar and Turkey. So the Qataris invested billions and billions and billions of money in uh, funneling uh, political money to the Muslim Brotherhood groups in Egypt, in Tunisia, and in Libya, and in Syria, and Turkey as well. So what happened is that uh, the, uh, the Al Jazeera, which has 300 million viewers viewership in, in, in the Arab world, the biggest news channel, day and night, they are uh, propagating and giving support to the Muslim Brotherhood groups. So the people thought that those are the best option for them, right? The media plays an instrumental role. And true enough, Muslim Brotherhood came to power in Tunisia. Muslim Brotherhood came to power in Egypt. And Libya has become divided between the Muslim Brotherhood and other Al-Qaeda types nowadays. And the country is divided. In Syria, it's the same. In Syria, the, the first time that there were calls for protests in Syria. It came by a Facebook page, which has millions of followers, uh, called the Syrian Revolution Against Bashar al-Assad. And the person behind Mm. this page, who created this page, he is the son of a notorious Muslim Brotherhood uh, Syrian member in exile in Sweden. So he was directing the protest from Sweden inside Syria. And he was giving them instructions, he was giving them uh, the titles, he was giving them the banners, he was giving them what should they shunt and what should be the slogans of these protests, etc. But um, I was in Syria many, many times during this time. I mean, the protests, all of them, it's like you can say 99% of the protests came from the mosques. And Mm. the mosques in Syria... um, came under influence from Qatar and Saudi Arabia, who had an invested interest in removing Assad from power. And this was the time when the Qataris were tasked by the Americans to remove Assad from power. And this is not me saying analysis now. This is the former foreign minister of Qatar, Hamad Ben Jassim. He says on a Qatari national TV when he resigned from his position in 2017-18 that the Americans tasked Qatar to remove Assad from power. And the Americans formed two military operations rooms, one in Turkey, in southern Turkey, and one in northern Jordan. And through these operational rooms, which included one, uh, Turkey, two, Qatar, Saudi Arabia, Jordan, the, the CIA, and the MI6, to fund and train and uh, funnel all sorts of support to these rebel groups in Syria, the insurgents in Syria. So Obama received uh, a document here from his Defense Intelligence Agency warning him, this is in 2012, so just one year after these events, told Obama, Mm. look, the driving force behind, I'm paraphrasing the document now, the driving force behind the anti-Assad movement in Syria are the Al Qaeda affiliates, are the jihadists, and this, this and the allies uh, or, or the opponents of Syria, they see this as a positive thing because they want to create an emirate, an Islamic emirate, a caliphate in Syria, to strangle and to uh, encircle the Syrian regime, right? So from the beginning, they knew that the people who are ready to take up arms and fight are the Islamists in Syria. And despite that, Obama right. put his signature on a secret CIA uh, operation uh, called Timber Sycamore. And Timber Sycamore is um, the one of the costliest CIA operations in, in the history of the agency. And they funneled one-tenth of the budget of the CIA every year to Syria. And they armed and trained and dumped weapons worth billions of dollars. So the CIA. So just yeah. to just to jump in there, sorry to cut you off, but so from the Western perspective, just 
full disclaimer, I grew up thinking that the USA was fighting a war on terror in the Middle East and they were they were the good guys, right? And what's one of the things that can be pretty hard to come to terms with when, when you look into the details enough that <laughs> this is a lot more complicated than that. So if you're looking at it from the Western perspective, for example, and you're saying they're fighting a war on terror over there, Saddam Hussein had weapons of mass destruction and they're, they're doing the right thing. Obviously, they've been hit by 9-11 and they have to go and you know fight this massive threat in the Middle East. Why on earth would they be funding these jihadi groups if they were fighting war on terror? So Mikhail Hudson, Professor Mikhail Hudson says uh, Al-Qaeda is a contract army for the United States. <laughs> and wherever, wherever there is a geopolitical conflict, you see that these ISIS types and Al-Qaeda types are fighting against the enemies of the United States. I will tell you a few facts about this. So the Defense Intelligence Agency knowing knew that the Islamists are the driving force. And Obama knowingly signed on a paper on the secret program to fund and arm the jihadists in Syria. Now, they had to find um, the mask. So they cannot just give weapons to Al-Qaeda. So they formed what is called the Free Syrian Army. And the Free Syrian Army is the front, is the brand, that they are. those are the milit uh, military officers from the Syrian army who supposedly deserted from the army and they joined what is called the Free Syrian Army against the dictatorship. But this was the brand. This was the marketing and the selling point. There were actually no Free Syrian Army in Syria. And there is no hierarchy. There is no defense ministry. There is nothing. There are few people who, yes, deserted from the Syrian army, but a few officers cannot form an army. The, the truth of the matter is that these weapons came from Libya to Turkey, and Turkey dumped them to Syria. And the Free Syrian Army, that they had these uh, few officers who deserted, they were the, 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 the middleman distributing all these weapons to the radical groups. So even when uh, uh, so-called Free Syrian Army attacked on Aleppo in 2012-2013, they were fighting with ISIS alongside, shoulder to shoulder, because they didn't have manpower. The, men, the real manpower were from ISIS and al-Nusra. So in 2012, the same year when the Defense Intelligence Agency was warning Obama not to arm the jihadists, uh, Jake Sullivan, who is again now in the uh, State Department uh, in Biden's administration, back then he was the advisor to Hillary Clinton. He sent an email to Hillary Clinton saying that, quote, Al-Qaeda is on our side in Syria. And this uh, email was leaked later by WikiLeaks to the press. So everybody knew in the State Department, in the Pentagon, who are they supporting in Syria, despite that they said that they are supporting what is called the moderate rebels. But there were no moderate rebels in Syria. Of course, there are some people with good intentions and they carried arms. Maybe they were victims of the uh, brutality of the Assad government and uh, some a family member got killed, something happened and they carried arms. But I'm saying that the driving force behind the up behind the insurgency and the people who are ready to die for a cause are the Islamists. And here comes the role of the religion and ideology. So many people in the West, they don't know what the Arabic channels are saying. They don't understand Arabic. But if you turned on your TV on Al Jazeera on a Friday uh, noontime, you will see that they bring clerics and very influential ones who gave fatwas and said that it is permissible to kill Syrians, quoting them, civilians and military officers if they support the Syrian government. They gave an actual fatwa to kill people. So the people on the ground who received these weapons during this time, they also got a, a permission, a religious permission to carry out the fight. Because in their view, Assad is from a minority religious sect called the Alevites. So mm. if, he's born, if he's born as an Alevite, they don't consider the Alevites as true Muslims. So they say that Damascus is being occupied by the infidels. So we have to liberate the country from the infidels and install an Islamic government. So this was the driving force. This is what drives, drove these militants to come to Syria and including tens of thousands of multinational terrorists from all around the world. The vast majority of them passed through Turkey. Turkey is a NATO uh, country. And when these multinational terrorists formed the Islamic State, the Caliphate in Raqqa, 
uh, they took over the oil fields in the east of Syria. So where did ISIS sell its oil? I mean, you can extract the oil, but you need a refinery or you have to send to a refinery, right? So when the hmm. Russians intervened in 2015 and they published the satellite images and the aerial images of what's happening in Syria, you can see hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of fuel tankers are slowly moving from Syria to Turkey. And the, the allegations uh, against Turkey that accusations against Turkey that the son of uh, Recep Tayyip Erdogan, Bilal, he was in charge of receiving uh, this oil and, to, and send them to the refineries. And uh, basically, ISIS was selling the Syrian oil to the black market in Turkey and receiving dollars in cash. So ISIS has converted itself, basically transformed itself from a terror group into a state because now they have an independent income. So they sell the oil to Turkey and they get the cash money so they can buy weapons. And here, uh, uh, all of a sudden, the Toyota trucks uh, miraculously dumped into Syria. ISIS all of a sudden has the latest new brand Toyota trucks, four-wheel trucks from all around. Like, who sent them this? How are they paying through all these uh, Toyota trucks, right? Because they had an access to the oil of Syria, 50% of the oil. Now, the Americans, uh, when the Russians intervened and they started to destroy ISIS, they also accelerated their um, war on, quote-unquote, on terror. And they didn't want for the Russians and the Syrian army to liberate the eastern parts of Syria and take over the oil fields. So they formed a new militia group called the Syrian Democratic Forces. And those are mostly the Kurdish militias. And they uh, fought with the Kurdish militias against ISIS and they took over the oil fields now. So b Americans are basically occupying the oil fields of Syria at the moment. Just one point before, uh, because I explained, I, I, I said two things about the, um, the support of the United States to ISIS and Al-Qaeda. One of which was the Defense Intelligence Agency document. The second was the email of Jake Sullivan to uh, Hillary Clinton. The third one is uh, John Kerry. John Kerry replaced Hillary Clinton. And in 2015, I believe this is in November, December 2015, just two months after the intervention of Russia in Syria, he had a meeting with uh, the S Syrian opposition figures in Washington, D.C. And uh, basically, Kerry told them, and this is recorded on audio, somebody was recording the conversation there and then sent it to WikiLeaks, um, that the United States was watching, he says, the ISIS expanding in Syria. And the United States thought that this is a good thing, that ISIS is expanding to Damascus because they thought that then Assad will come under immense pressure to compromise with the, with the Americans. And he says, according to Kerry, that instead of Assad compromising, he got Putin on his side and he came, uh, Putin came to save Assad uh, in, in Damascus at the last moment. This is Kerry, right? We have the former um, special envoy um, uh, of the U.S. to Syria, Jeffrey, I forgot his family name, but his name is Jeffrey. He gave an interview to an American press saying that uh, the Jolani, who is the leader of Al-Qaeda in, in Idlib, he says he is an asset for the American strategy in Syria. Those are all direct quotations from American officials. And if we, if we don't want to depend on uh, the uh, statements of American officials, I can assure you 100% that when... Al-Qaeda types invaded uh, the city of Idlib, and then they wanted to go to northern Latakia. This was a direct decision from the CIA to the Al-Qaeda forces to invade. And, and the vast majority of the fighters were not Syrians. They were Tajikis. They were from Chechnya. They were from Saudi Arabia. They were from Egypt, all around the world. And they committed acts of genocide, and they killed people based on their identity. Like, they check your identity if they, if they see or they consider you an infidel, according to their understanding of religion, you're dead. You have no chance. And they, they, 
We have pictures and footage of the massacres that they committed, heinous, heinous crimes. And um, those were all endorsed by, uh, by the CIA because they wanted to have an access to the Mediterranean. The plan was to divide Syria, right? But to balkanize Syria, to divide it, you need to have an access to the waters. Uh, a landlocked country inside Syria, dividing Syria into different lines. But if the opposition doesn't have an access to the Mediterranean, they're landlocked, then you don't know what could the circumstances be in the future. Maybe Turkey turns against them, maybe the Iraqis come against them. So they will be like an isolated island. So they wanted them to have an access to the waters. And that's why this invasion happened to Idlib, and they wanted to go forward to northern Latakia, and they reached to the Mediterranean. They stepped into the waters, but then they were pushed back again by joint operations by so Russia and uh, Syria. So why did they want to topple Syria so badly? I mean, what's so strategical about Syria? So the official narrative, Assad is a dictator and they have to remove him from power because there is a, a popular uprising against him and people want democratic change. And I, I want to say something very clear. I don't think Syria yeah. is uh, a, a democracy. And I don't think that Syria is uh, Switzerland, that everything is fine. And I don't claim that. I want for mm -hmm. Syria to be better. I want for Syria to have an active parliamentary life. I want for Syria to have political parties opposing the, the government. And I want for the opposition to have freedom to criticize everyone in Syria, including the president. I want that. I live in Germany. And nowadays I get bothered by the fact that I'm not able to say my opinion about the Palestine case. So I value freedom. However, you cannot come and say that we want democratic change in Syria, and at the same time, the, uh, the, 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 the political programs that you're putting for Syria are all undemocratic. You want an Islamic yeah. caliphate in Syria. Say you want an Islamic caliphate. There is nothing wrong about that. But don't lie to me and say, I want democracy, but you work towards theocracy. And in my opinion, the theocracy is worse than a, a dictatorship. This is just my opinion, so I don't want that, right? Secondly, why the Americans want to, to remove Assad from power? And you can think from whichever side you think about this case, the answer is Israel. In any way, in, from any side you look into the conflict in Syria, the answer is Israel. Israel was the driving force behind knocking out Saddam Hussein from power. And they were the driving force behind the destabilization of Syria. And now they are the driving force behind this escalation against Iran. And what the Israelis want is complete dominance in the region and to end the Palestinian conflict completely. Right. And we know now that they want to kick the Palestinians, two million of them, out of Gaza. They say it, not me. They are talking about the Amaleks and they are talking about nuking them and committing all these crimes against them. So who are the powers? Um, that give tangible support to the Palestinians who carry arms against the Israeli occupation forces. It's Iran, it's Syria, it's Hezbollah. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I'm saying it very, very honestly to you. Who sends them the weapons? Who gives them training? Who, who teaches them the technological uh, knowledge? How can Hamas itself produce drones or rockets? They take all these courses in Syria, in Iran, it's a knowledge, shared knowledge between these powers, right? So the Israelis wanted to end the Palestinian issue. They want to have one state solution. And the obstacle is Syria, Hezbollah, and uh, Iran. So they found that the weaker element in this, in their understanding, it's Syria. If they break Syria, mm -hmm. which is the route to in sending these weapons to Hezbollah, and Hezbollah uh, then smuggles them to Gaza through the tunnels in Egypt and from uh, different ways, uh, then there will be no more weapons coming first to Hezbollah and second to Hamas. So removing Assad from the scene is a preface of blocking the access of the Palestinians to weapons. This is how they saw this conflict in Syria. We remove Assad from power, we install a friendly government to the United States, which says, I want to normalize relations with Israel, just like the Saudis, the Emirates, the Bahrainis, the Moroccans, Egyptians, Jordanians. Then Hezbollah will be um, encircled in Lebanon, in just southern Lebanon, and nobody is able to deliver weapons to Hezbollah anymore because they don't have Syria, right? So 
Um, the plan was that uh, bring the service groups to Syria, remove Assad from power, and then let the service groups go to Lebanon. So they were going to do the job of the Israelis against Hezbollah. So Hezbollah knows the plan. They have intel, and they're not stupid. So they came to Syria fighting them before they come to Lebanon. And actually, Hezbollah, right. Hezbollah sent around, at, at the peak, they were like 20,000. And uh, the beginning was around 5,000. But they were, they were game changers in Syria. Um, everyone that I met in Syria who fought with Hezbollah fighters, because the Syrian army, um, I have friends in the Syrian army who, are, who were my colleagues in the university, in school. Everybody serves the army in Syria. And everybody says like Hezbollah mm-hmm. fighters are very, very competent, and they actually even Donald Trump said that. Mm-hmm. And uh, uh, yeah. yesterday I was on a podcast, and somebody asked me about Hezbollah, and many Americans do not know that Hezbollah paid hundreds of la- hundreds of its souls and lives of their sons in Lebanon. They came to Syria to fight against ISIS, Nusra, and all these types. And they protected the Christian villages. They protected the Christian mm, towns. Yeah. They they actually liberated many of the Christian towns in Syria, right? And the biggest ally of uh, Hezbollah in Lebanon is the Lebanese uh, uh, patriotic movement, and it's a it's a Christian movement in, in in Lebanon. So people do not know these facts, unfortunately. And Hezbollah is just considered a terrorist group because they are fighting against the Israelis. And we know nowadays what's the meaning of terrorism. Like if you fight against the occupier of your country, then you're a terrorist, you know? So, yeah. so I don't buy so, that. So, I mean, the, the, the counter to that would be that if you look at Israel on a map, and this is often invoked, they're this tiny little country, and then they're surrounded by all of these countries who want to wipe them off the face of the earth. So you've got Hezbollah to their north, you've got the Houthis down south, and the Houthis have death to America, death to Israel is one of their slogans. And then they're all funded by the IRGC in Iran and they, you know, they're Islamists and they all want to kill Israel. So the intelligent thing one might think for Israel to do is to make themselves as strong as possible and maybe to even, like you said, destabilize the countries around yes. them. Because if they don't do that, one might say that they're just going to get wiped off the face of the earth. So I mean, is that not the right, the smart thing for them to look, do? Look, uh, is- Israelis have to, uh, if they want to preserve the the system that they established in Israel uh, on a Palestinian territory, of course, you want to preserve what you have gained for 70 years. And you have to preserve the the racial segregation and many of the injustices that they inflicted upon the Palestinian people. Of course, if, you, if you're coming from Manhattan or you're coming from Poland or Ukraine or Russia and you recently resided in, in Israel, you want to preserve that. I, I, I don't say I understand it. But uh, it's understandable that uh, they want to uh, hold on what they have, and there are so many, hi- hi- so uh, lots of history behind it. And uh, I would not. And it's kind of speaking purely from a place of like might, because the world, oftentimes when you look at it, can be a battle of power dynamics. So if Israel wants to keep their power, that, that's that's what I mean. Like they, they, it might be the the best thing for them. To I do. understand your point, and I'm saying that there is also mm. history behind it. There is a true anti-Semitism and there is a Holocaust that happened and many of the Jewish people just want to live in peace. I understand that. But it's not on the expense on other people. This is the point. The Jewish people in Syria, Jewish people in Lebanon and Jewish people in Palestine and in Iraq, they all lived in peace. And when the uh, Portuguese and the Spanish were per- persecuting against the Jewish people, the Jewish people found safe haven and shelter in Morocco, in Algeria, in Tunisia, and in Egypt, in Syria, they came to the Middle East and North Africa, right? So the, the there was no religious problem against the Jewish people. The problem started with the creation of Israel and the, 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 and mm. the division of, of Palestine into two countries. It, it was three. There was a Palestine, Israel, and then uh, the Jerusalem was internationally uh, controlled uh, area. So what happened, we have to put this in the proper context. The Brits were occupying Palestine after the fall of the Ottoman Empire. So they were the, uh, the, 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 what they called the mandate, right, (laughs) of Palestine. Mm. And during this time, they encouraged mass migration of the Jewish people from Europe and from uh, Russia, from uh, Ukraine, from the rest of the countries to, to Palestine. And they engineered the increase 
uh, increasing percentage of the Jewish people there. Now, if the Jewish people came to uh, Palestine, to Syria, as refugees, they would have been embraced completely. Two million refugees from Iraq in Syria, half a million refugees from Palestine to Syria, 300,000 refugees from Lebanon to Syria, different religions and sects. Nobody asked them, what is your religion? In Syria, nobody knows what is the, your religion. Uh, unless your name is Muhammad or Hussein or something, nobody knows what's your religion. Nobody asks, what is your religion? The problem was political with Israel, that it, it mm. is not just to just come and slice Palestine into two and give half of it to the Jewish people and the half of it for, for the Palestinian people when the Jewish people were the minority there, despite all the migration waves that the Brits have engineered into Palestine. So this is the starting point. If the Jewish people today want to live in Palestine, like equals, to the Palestinians, regardless of their religion, sects, school of thought, whatever, they are hundred percent welcomed. I'm I, I I'm Syrian, and I want for the Jewish community to come back to Syria. And many of them migrated uh, uh, in the past two decades uh, and three decades from Syria. And I have a Jewish friend who recently visited to Damascus, and he is reopening the cathedrals and the religious sites of the Jewish community in Damascus. There are no cool. persecution against the Jewish people for being a Jew uh, in Syria. And he told me recently, because after October 7, you know, there is so much sensitivity nowadays, and some of some Jewish people, they are afraid to wear the kippah. And I understand that. And he told me uh, he, feels, he feels safer in walking in Damascus with the kippah than in Manhattan. That he was, he was born in, yeah. he was born in, the, in, in Manhattan, right? Do you think that there would be other parts of Syria that he wouldn't feel so safe? Uh, he would feel safe, for example, in Aleppo, in Latakia, in Tartus. He will never feel safe in uh, Idlib, where it's the sa largest hmm. safe haven for Al Qaeda terrorists in the world, according to the Pentagon, right? So um, nowadays, after October seven, I truly believe that uh, anti-Semitism has increased and some people uh, cannot really fathom and under not everyone is smart, you know, not everyone can draw the distinctions. And there are so many people with bad intentions joined the pro-Palestine community claiming to be pro-Palestine, but out of hatred to the Jewish people. I understand all these things and I know these people one by one mm. and I don't support them, you know. Um, the truth yeah. of the matter is today in Palestine, if the Jewish people decide and their government decide that they have to dissolve this uh, segregate, this discrimination and discriminatory system and the apartheid against the, uh, the rest of the people there, they are most welcome. But I'm also being very realist with you. After what happened in, in, in Gaza, I don't think yeah. that this um, dissolving the apartheid is going to be without blood. I'm, I, I, I'm being very mm -hmm. honest with you. And 70% uh, yeah. of the Israeli people say that the Israeli army is using uh, proportionate or, or not enough force in Gaza. Uh, this is according to a new study mm. in January of this year. And 70%, uh, you know, it's, um, it's, it's sad because um, many of the people in Israel are living in a bubble and they don't know what's, uh, what type of discussion is going on outside their communities and outside Israel and how the people are perceiving what's happening in the Gaza Strip. Israel doesn't have the right to kill all these people, um, 16, 17,000 children in, 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 in the Gaza Strip under the guise of self-defense. There is no self-defense like that. I have never, I have been watching yeah. wars I've lived a war in Syria. I have never seen uh, a, an army can drop uh, this type of weapons on highly populated areas uh, without having the intention to kill these civilians. It's impossible. It doesn't, it doesn't happen that way. Yeah. They wiped out entire neighborhoods and um, now they want to go to Rafah. So the yeah. goal is clear. Everybody is conspiring. I, I think that a lot of people would... A lot of people who might be watching this might be a little bit shocked by what they're hearing and they might not have heard this perspective before. But one of the things that I've learned from traveling a lot is that the world is a lot more complicated than what you hear on the US media, yeah. for example, what you hear in the Australian media. So I would encourage people to go to your channel, research themselves more, check out what you've said. We've got a 
about 10 more minutes and there's about a million more things I'd like to go into with you. But one of the things that I'm particularly interested in is the fact that you grew up as a Christian in Syria. Now, when many people think of Christians, they think of Europe, they think of America, but actually where you're from is the cradle of civilization and it's where Christianity originated. Yeah. So what is this, what is the state of Christianity over there? Because I've heard that there's been much persecution of Christians and the Christian community isn't exactly what it used to be in the Middle East. Yeah. So, um, f first of all, it's very, the story of my family is very interesting. I told you I'm born in an Armenian family. So the Armenians are the early mm. Christians, the first Christian nation in the world. So the first con first mm. nation that adopted Christianity as a state religion was Armenia in 301 after Christianity. And the 11th was the birthplace of Jesus Christ. And in Syria, um, there is, uh, for example, in Aleppo, the tradition that uh, in front of every church, there is a mosque and in front of every mosque, there is a church. So wherever, wherever you go in Aleppo, where I grew up or in Damascus and you see a mosque and you just turn like this, you will see a church everywhere. Right. Mm. And, um, the Christians were considered, I mean, the government in Syria since the sixties and the seventies, they have given a uh, special care, let's say, to the Christians in Syria. And the Christians in Syria were very productive in, in the society, in, in art, culture, and also in politics, right? And um, when this destabilization started to happen in the region, for example, Iraq lost 90% of its Christian population after the invasion of Iraq. You can argue whether Saddam mm. Hussein was a monster or not, but the Christians were living in safety. Uh, in Iraq before 2003. In Syria, it's the same. Um, the Armenian community, for example, we have had around 100,000 Armenians in Syria, and now the estimates are 15,000. And the same thing goes for the Christians. Christian community has lost probably half, 60%, even more. And this was targeted. Yeah. And I can, I can give you an example why it was targeted and how it was targeted. When many of the Christian people fled to Lebanon or to Armenia, Armenians went to Armenia and some of the Christians went to Lebanon to escape the war, there were NGOs uh, who would guarantee you migration in a few weeks to Canada, to Australia, uh, to the United States and other countries, only for the Christians. Like you have to be just a Syrian Christian mm. and in a few weeks, many of my friends and family members in few weeks, they were in Canada. So they, Australia accepted many. Yeah, so they targeted yeah. them. They took them all. And now after 10 years or 12 years of war, how many of them want to go back to Syria to this situation? And uh, half the country is destroyed. The construction cannot proceed because there are sanctions. The inflation is, you cannot even, uh, I cannot even say the numbers anymore. I don't know. But uh, mm. if one if one uh, dollar in 2011, when the war started, was 50 Syrian lira. So every 15 Syrian lira was one dollar. It's now 15,000. So you, you wow. can, you, you do math. You do the math. I'm not good in math. <laughs> uh, yes. Yeah, so, Me neither. Yeah, so, so, the, so. There, there are there were security concerns and you have economic concerns. Uh, uh, people after ten years they established new lives. Probably they found someone to marry. Probably they went to university. Probably they started some business or found jobs. You know, and I don't think they will come back to mm. Syria. And uh, this is very sad because Syria has uh, Christian towns where people speak Aramaic. Uh, the language of Jesus Christ, for example, in uh, Malula, which was, by the way, occupied by these rebels, and they destroyed many of the monasteries there. And um, Armenian uh, language, for example, many of these languages will disappear, unfortunately, from Syria. And this is something that you have to ask yourself a question. Why? Why would any group attack on a peaceful town like Malula when the people were not even holding arms? This is targeted. Why would these insurgents go to Palmyra? What's the so important for them strategically or militarily in Palmyra? They don't have a military mm. pur a purpose. The purpose is to destroy the civilization of Syria, to destroy the identity of Syria, to deprive it from its identity. This is something that is very important. You can see it in front of your eyes. How is it proceeding in other Western countries that uh, your identity nowadays 
is about your sexuality, mm. it's about your gender, yeah. it, it's about your all these things. It's and you have to be proud of it. <laughs> it's yeah. not about your yeah. uh, belonging to your country or for your successes in life or what you achieved in life. And this is something similar that they did to Syria. They destroyed the visual identity of Syria. If you go to Palmyra, the Romans, the Greeks, many of the empires passed through these places and they left their monuments, their uh, artifacts, right? And they are mostly destroyed mm. or robbed and then sold in, in, in the black market. They used to take it to Lebanon, uh, Iraq, Turkey, other countries, and they would end up later in one of the museums, probably in in London, right? And this is mm. this is robbery. They they destroyed our. They didn't only destroy our lives, and I'm saying it with a heavy heart. They destroyed our past, mm. and they also destroyed our future. I mean, how, it's demoralization. How many people now in Syria you think wake up in the morning and feel like they're happy? and they want to go to work and do something productive. You really think that somebody who has two hours of electricity per day, who cannot even charge his mobile, who cannot even do any business, he cannot do transaction, he cannot buy anything, he cannot leave the country unless he pays $10,000 to the smuggler to take him to Europe illegally. You can come to Europe illegally in a more, e more easily then applying to a visa and say, I'm coming to study in Germany, for example. Mm. I know so many of my friends. But I mean, the, uh, when you look at the American government, for example, one of the things that like the cornerstones of people getting elected is that, you know, they're evangelical Bible bashing Christians. Why on earth would the these so-called Christians that are at the high, high echelons of American government not care about the biblical places, the most important places in Christianity, being destroyed and Christianity in the Middle East basically being destroyed. And really, there, there doesn't look like mm -hmm. there's going to be a path back. Yeah. We also saw what happened in uh, Nagorno-Karabakh yes. last year. Why does this not make the news? Why do they not care about the Christians in the Middle East, you think? So uh, a few days ago, I was speaking with Janice Kortkamp. Uh, she, 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 she's from the United States and she became Christian Zionist when she was 40 years old for 10 years. And when she was 50 years old and she had a conversation with the Palestinians and Syrians who migrated recently to her country. And she says those were like completely opposite of what I heard in my church, from my pastor, mm. from the media, from the press, from everything that is going. He says, we're living living in a ghetto here in the United States. We don't know what's happening around the world. So she decided to make crowdfunding. And I remember this. She came to Syria to see with her own eyes. And once she came to Syria, mm. she regrets living her life as a Zionist and not knowing that her money and her words and her support to Israel and the rest in the region actually harmed the uh, the Christians in the region. And uh, simply they don't care about the Christians of, uh, of the region. You're not, especially uh, Christian Orthodox, which is the dominant uh, Christ Christian school in, uh, in the region, and their affiliation is more to Russia and more into preserving their conservative values, let's say, as a Christian community, mm. than being open, open, opening up the church to uh, the neoliberal uh, values, for example. I mean, personally, if I'm a Christian, then I'm a Christian. Uh, if I'm a Muslim, I'm a Muslim. I'm, I cannot come and say, I'm a Christian, but, right? And uh, I don't know mm. anyone who who really believes in his religion. I'm not a practice like I'm not practicing Christian. I was I grown up in a Christian family, and I am I grew up as a Christian son. In but I don't go to the church mm. all the time. I don't pray. But I was raised on these values, right? But now I don't think that uh, Christians should accept everything, and there shouldn't be any limits in their religion just to appease the demands from the Western elites that they have to accept all sorts of sexualities and uh, different types of uh, um, practices in religion or change the religion itself. The only religion nowadays, in my opinion, that is saying no conclusively, it's Islam. It's, uh, the, the Muslim people are conclusive about these cases. But so many Christians in the West, they say they are Christians, but 
they are open to non-Christian values. And I'm not against that. Yeah. Don't understand me wrong. I'm 100% for anyone to choose his, uh, to pick his sexuality, his identity. As long as you're not harming anyone, you do you, you know? I'm just saying that this is targeted also against the uh, Christianity to destroy um, one of the shelters and the protectors of the family values and uh, the ch- protection of the children and so many other things uh, in, in, in family mm. relationships. So the, to hit the nuclear of the family. And mm. if you defend against it, and uh, for example, Qatar, which I which is a country that uh, I despise their foreign policy, but I respected their position mm. on that we are a Muslim country And we don't accept homosexuality in our country. But despite that, you see how many Western leaders, they went there with the the rainbow flags on there. This is complete disrespect. Ridiculous. It's disrespect. Ridiculous. I don't come, I shouldn't come to your country and and tell you like, those are my values, you accept it, or I I put it like a stick into your eyes. So um, the Mm. liberal values have to be... uh, cooked naturally if somebody wants to adopt it after reading about it after learning about it society is the same thing democracy is the same thing the elections for example Mm. syrian society where i come from we are a patriotic uh, patriarchy and the relationship in the family for example the father is the head of the family and if the father says yes it's a yes if the father says no it's a no yeah. my father never said yes in his life when i was a young never not even <laughs> once he said no he said no <laughs> and he had silence yeah. the silence then you have to ask your mother and then you get the, uh, the from, <laughs> from from your mother the answer but he never said yes and uh, our relationship with god Right, and the people always mm. seek to God and seek for a higher authority, and that also explains why we they uh, they crave for a leader to come like a ten year, twenty year, thirty year, forty years sometimes, and they start to mm. to see him as a father figure. It's a different mentality in the society. If you want to change that, I'm not saying that it has to be changed, but if you want to change that, this has to be organic and natural change in the mm. society. If you bring it from outside and enforce it on the people, yeah. then there will be destabilization. And and rest assured, if they bring free elections to Syria and democracy and everything, the Armenians are going to vote for the Armenian MPs and the Muslims are going to vote for the Muslim MPs and the Shias are, everybody is going to vote for his uh, religion, religious and sect and school of thought. And that's not how I see yeah. uh, elections. I see election as a political program that if I'm convinced of somebody's political program who is regardless of his religion and sect, I would vote for him. But it's not. this mm. is not the concept yet in, in the region. And I'm not saying that's wrong. Probably that's better for them. It's working for them. That's why I say Western intervention has to stop in the region. Yeah, and uh, yeah, I would agree. Uh, Western intervention only adds fuel to the fire in the region, and the people have to find what is best for them. It's not up. And uh, to be honest with you, after the Gaza massacres, Western governments, they can only shut up. <laughs> don't preach anything yeah. to the rest of the world. You lost the moral high ground. You don't have it anymore. Mm. Kavorg, I'm... I can't believe this has already gone for an hour. I wish we could go longer, but I'm going to respect your time. So if you, I'm going to have all of your links below, but if you don't mind telling people where you would prefer them to find you. Actually, I'm posting daily live streams on YouTube and on Rumble, Syriana Analysis, between Monday to Friday at 11 a.m. Eastern American time, 5 p.m. Central European time, trying to host guests and analyze the different geopolitical conflicts around the world. I would really appreciate it if uh, uh, that's the place where to go. Yeah, very interesting stuff. Would highly recommend it. So thank you so much for joining me. Thank you so much for having me. Really, I really appreciate it.